Well, welcome. We're continuing with our review of the appendicular skeleton. We're moving our way um, distally on the arm. Um, we looked at the bones of the brachium, uh, the humerus, and the, the scapula, which helps it to make the joint for the shoulder. Now we are taking a look at the antebrachial area, and we're going to look at our ulna, our radius, our carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Okay, so I'll set these aside for a moment. Let's focus these two uh, side by side in the forearm or antebrachium. Um, I'm going to take a look at, well, we'll take a look at the ulna first. The ulna is the one that looks like a plumber's wrench. Definitely looks like a wrench here. One of the features students need to know is this very pointy structure here. It's sticking off of the bone, therefore it is a process. We're halfway there. And it's in the shape of a, of a nice point, like the point on your Burger King crown that you get when you go for your on your birthday. Okay, so we call this a coronoid process because it's shaped like the point on a crown. The other coronoid process we would like students to know is in the mandible, um, and you can take a look at that uh, to compare that to this ulna. I don't have one handy at the moment. We call this space right here, which is going to fit right onto the humerus on the trochlear side, where the pulley side of the condyle is, we call it the trochlear notch. Okay? A notch is sort of a semicircular with an open side on it space. Okay. Um, there's an ulnar tuberosity that kind of sticks off here. There are going to be, there are going to be uh, ligaments that attach between, uh, dense regular connective tissue attaching between your ulna and your radius and that helps to keep them from sliding around and moving out of place. Okay. Down at the distal end of the, of the ulna, we have a very pointy little process. This one's more needle-like, and so this one's referred to as the styloid process of the ulna. You're going to have one on your radius. You also have one on your temporal bone of the skull. So three places to remember those. The stylus is a needle, like the stylus on a phonograph or the stylus that you use to punch the buttons on a... Um, a, a, f a phone that has tiny buttons on it for texting, etc. Um, it's, it's also what was used to describe the inst writing instrument that the Egyptians used to do hieroglyphic hieroglyphics with was a stylus. Okay. Now, the big head of the wrench is what we usually refer to as the elbow or the point of your elbow, and that is called the olecranon, O-L-E-C-R-A-N-O-N, -E and um, some people say olecranon, whatever helps you remember it. This is the radial fossa or notch right here, and that radius is going to create a, an articulation or a joint there with the ulna and is able to rotate in that space so that you can flip your hand back and forth um, whenever you turn a doorknob, when you turn the key in your car. We call that pronation and supination. We'll get to that when we talk about muscles. Okay. If we take a look at the radius, it looks like a great big golf tee to me. If you look directly at the end of that radius, it's very round. That's a hole from a drill, so there's no hole there normally. These were screwed together on a model, and we took it apart. But that nice round top on it, plus you look at it from the side, and it really does look a lot like a golf tee, only very long. And our little ball is going to sit there, our capitulum, from our um, lateral side of the condyle in the humerus. Okay. Radial tuberosity, looks like a potato, a white lumpy potato here. Um, again, for attachment, dense regular connective tissue, ligaments between the radius and the ulna. If we go to the distal end of the radius, we again see a pointy little process. It's not quite as pointy. We'll compare it to the one on the ulna, but it's pretty pointy, and it's uh, referred to as a styloid process as well. So you have that on each side of your wrist. So if you palpate your wrist right now, okay, if you were to palpate, let's see, we'll do this one, okay, so remember that your ulna is on your pinky side and your radius is on your thumb side, and if you just run your finger down here until you feel the bone the little in a space, that's your radial styloid process, and you can see your ulnar one quite well um, is down here on the, the wrist. Um, okay, so let's talk about the carpals then. 
moving on down the pike. The carpels are a little challenging. People have trouble remembering there's eight bones in here. They have some very distinctive names. It's hard to remember the order, the position, etc. So we have a couple of little mnemonics that people can use. Um, uh, I have what's called the G-rated version and the R-rated version. The R-rated version I actually learned from my students. So the G-rated version I learned way back 100 years ago when I was in college is if you write down Sally left the party to take, oops, excuse me, to take Connie home, okay, and then you can remember the first letter represents the first letter of each of these bones. Now, the S for Sally stands for scaphoid, this big one, and when we say this little verse or write this little verse, we're always going to start on, no matter where the hand is, we can do this, if you remember to always start on the thumb side in anatomical position, that's lateral, whether it's right or left, on the thumb side, say the rhyme and go across, okay, toward the pinky side. So that's from what we would call the number one set of metacarpals and phalanges, two, three, four, five. So one, two, five. Then we go back across, we start at the thumb again, and do the distal row, which goes with our second verse. So the proximal row, goes with our first verse, and the distal row goes with our second verse. Okay? Now I'd like to show you a few of these odds and ends bones. So here are some pieces when they're taken apart from your, um, from your carpals in your hand. Okay? And they are named because of their shapes for the most part. So scaphoid refers to boat. And this one is the most boat-shaped one. It's shaped like a little rowboat or a little dinghy, okay? And that's that one. And then the next one is Sally Left, L for lunate. And lunate stands for moon. And so this one looks like a crescent moon right here. So that's the lunate. I don't expect my students to be able to recognize these individually, but it does help them to learn the names a little better if they've seen these various shapes. The last two on our first verse is the party. And this is actually, rep this is two bones on a real hand, but because this is a, a polymer model, they kind of got stuck together and they didn't saw them apart because then they'd have to screw them back together again to get them in position anyway. So this one is the T in the, stands for triquetrum or triquetrum, which means three points, okay, like a triangle. And then this one is called the pisiform, or pisiform, or pisiform. I've heard it all three ways. I like to say pisiform. Maybe it's a little bit off color, but it re it, p this pisiform means pea-shaped, as in a pea that you eat with your supper. But a lot of people use the word pea to describe piss, and so if it helps you to remember that the pisiform goes here like this and sits on top of the triquetrum, okay, or triquetrum, that might help you remember that position. So that's those four from this first row. Scaphoid, lunate, I'm going to turn this a little bit so you can see, triquetrum, pisiform. Okay, it kind of sits up on top instead of being over to the side. Right? And that's going to make your carpal tunnel. It's going to come up the side here and make a little wall. See this wall? And then that's going to leave a space for the tendons and the nerves and blood vessels to go into the hand through this little space right here in the wrist, the carpal tunnel. Okay, so we're going to do row two. Row two is to take Connie home. Okay, so I haven't given you the R version yet, but hang in there. We'll get there. So this one, the first one, is the trapezium, and the second one is the trapezoid. Let me get these lined up here. Okay, so trap a trapezoid shape in geometry, if anybody remembers, was kind of like a triangle or a pyramid with the top chopped off. And that's what this is right here, okay? And it has that kind of pyramidal shape with a flat top, or like a plateau, you could think of, okay? That's the trapezium. And right next to it is the trapezoid. Anything with oid on the end means like something else. So it's like the trapezium. I remember these two because I always think that this is big brother, this is little brother. Big brother's bigger, big brother's older, so he came first. And little brother follows him around because he wants to be like big brother, so he's trapezoid, and, he, and this one here is trapezium. So I don't know if that helps you, but it helped me when I was learning these. Um, the next one in line is our biggest one. Doo, 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 it's a big bone. 
in the middle of the carpus there, and it has a beautiful round head on it. So we're going to call it the capitate. The word capit refers to head along with cephalo and um, cranio. They all mean head, but in this case, um, the capitulum sits right under the lunate. The lunate makes like a hat on top of it. Okay. And then the scaphoid knees. So the capitate's right here. It's the very big one in the middle with a nice round head on it. So you can remember that hopefully because of the capitate situation. And then our last one in the last row was to take Connie home. Home is the hamate. And if you look at the hamate, it's got this really pretty curvy hook on it. The word hamate means hooked. And so this is the hooked bone. It sits right next to the trichetrum and pisiform. And the two of those together, move those out of the way, the two of those together, the hamate hook right here, you can see that hook right there, and the pisiform stack up, and that makes this lateral side of the, excuse me, it's the medial side of the um, carpal tunnel. Okay, sorry, I was looking through this, and it's looking reversed to me. So um, that's where your carpal tunnel structures go through, blood vessels, nerves, etc. Okay, so here's the R-rated version. Instead of remembering uh, Sally left the party to take Connie home, you could try some lovers try positions that they can't handle. And that will give you the same set of letters to help remember your, your bones by. The last couple things about our hand, once you get these, it's so easy. This is going to be the same on your other hand, um, and it's going to be virtually almost the same in the foot, except that the tarsus will be, a, uh, the tarsal area will be slightly different than the carpus. The carpus is this whole unit of bones. The bones that are in it are called the carpal bones, but it's the same structures. Carpal is the pertaining to version. Um, carpus is the thing itself. Okay, so we're going to number one starting at thumb, two, three, four, five. These are going to be metacarpals. The next row are going to be proximal phalanges, singular phalanx or phalange. Phalanx is the more Latin. Uh, phalange is the anglicized version. And then we go across. In the long fingers, these would be middle phalanges, two, three, four, five, excuse me, two, three, four, five. And then on the thumb, you only have two. The thumb or pollux only has two phalanges in it, so it's a proximal and a distal. And in the other fingers, it's proximal, middle, distal, so that you have um, proximal two, dis middle two, distal two, proximal three, middle three, distal three, proximal four, middle four, distal four, proximal five, middle five, distal five, phalanges or flanx. And there you have it. Go out and learn that hand. Stay tuned for more on the uh, pelvic girdle and lower limbs.